At this time, we would like to ask our great kids to go to Kids Connection with Miss Michelle. Give them a hand. Sometimes I just want to go with them because I think they have a whole lot of fun down there. I, did you know that they have a sucker tree down there? And if you invite a guest or if you bring somebody, they get to go to the sucker tree. The beauty of the sucker tree is it's made out of wood and there's all these suckers on there. Hidden on the stem of one of those suckers is a red dot. And if you pull the sucker that has the red dot, I think you get a dollar. Nice. Yeah. We should have a sucker tree here. Yeah, we need a sucker tree. Is everybody doing great today? Okay, did you come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you come to learn a little bit more about the Bible you didn't know before you came in? That's why we're here. We're here to celebrate. We're here to learn. And then we are being sent to go take whatever we learn out there. Amen? We got to do something with it. If we, have you ever watched the show Hoarders? Hoarders on cable. It's awful. I started watching it, and many times I have to turn it off because it's so grotesque. But, um, you know, if you keep taking in and keep taking in, and it, it begins to get chaotic and cluttered and you don't do anything with it, well, if you do that with the Lord's Word, if you do that, when you, when you come and you gather um, the love of your fellow man and the word of God and opportunities because you're challenged by the word of God. And if you keep that to yourself, you're a hoarder. You're a cluttered, hoarding mess. And God can't use that. What good is the word if you keep it to yourself? It is to be shared. Jesus shared it. He shared it. So we need to share it. So um, there's a few things in the Bible, though, that I was thinking about this, um, that we have maybe some um, reprogramming to do in our brains. There's some sayings that people say that they think are good. They might come from the Bible. They think they do come from the Bible, but they are in error. So I want to cover a few of those in the next couple of weeks. Some common things. Have you ever noticed that there are phrases people use commonly that are actually incorrect. You might have noticed some people saying things like this. Look up on the screen. An escape goat. When actually it's supposed to be a scapegoat. Okay? Another one is, it's a doggy dog world. <laughs> and it should be a dog eat dog world. That's the world we live in. What about hunger pains? It should really be hunger pangs. However, I do, when I'm hungry, kind of get out of my way if you're in between me and the food, because I got pains in here that are going to get me to that food. But anyway, um, unfortunately, there's some things that are, um, that we think are in the Bible. They've snuck into the church. They've snuck into our Christian life. And um, they're in direct conflict with what's in the Word of God. And we're going to correct something today. For the next several weeks, we're going to be doing this. Some people think these sayings ought to be in the Bible. They might be good sayings, but they're not in the Word of God. So we're going to correct that. This is why it's really, really important that you know your Word. If there is nothing else that I do while I'm here at this church but to get you to open up your own Bible and know it for yourself, then I've accomplished something. This word is meant individually for you, for me. I can't study it for you. You need to know what it says, and you need to live it. Because one day, when you're standing in front of Jesus, I'm not going to be with you. Pastor Les isn't going to be with you. It's going to be you and the judge. Learn the Word of God. Learn the Word of God. So today, we're going to look at a phrase called, God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that said? I've heard it, and I've said it myself. This phrase sounds really good. It sounds even sensible, but it is not 
what the Bible says. Sometimes we say things because we don't know what else to say. And it's a phrase that we've heard before, and it might fit into this situation. So we kind of roll with it, and it rolls off of our tongue. And we say it without really thinking it or meaning it. Okay? But we're going we're gonna to take a look at this today. And we're going to put some biblical context to it. So we're going to take a look at the book of Matthew, chapter 6. I want you to jot that down in your notes because I want you to pull out your Bibles this week. And I want you to look up chapter 6 in the book of Matthew. It's in the New Testament. It is a gospel. And uh, in Matthew, chapter 6, Jesus is speaking. This verse comes shortly after what we're going to read. It comes shortly after the Beatitudes in chapter 5. And Jesus addresses things like murder in chapter 6, divorce, the Lord's Prayer, taking oaths, forgiveness, loving your enemies, giving to the needy, all of these kinds of topics. If you have a red letter Bible, chapter 5 and 6, most of it's in red letter. That means Jesus is speaking. So we're going to start... Um, Jesus is correcting some, some erroneous things on these topics. And so he addresses those. It's very clear what he says. And Jesus is now getting to the nitty-gritty in the verses we're going to read about everyday life and what's really important. So Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 25, says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? We humans get pretty, pretty wrapped up about our lives in general. But Jesus is being very specific here because he's talking about eating, drink, and what we wear on our bodies. Think for just a moment. Look at your own closet for just a minute, okay? Open up the door and take a look inside your own closet. Think about how much time we spend thinking about these things. Eating the food in your pantry and the clothes that you wear in your closets. We think about um, all of these things every day. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think, what am I doing today and what do I need to wear? Do you not think about those things? Am I the only one? Okay, Angela says she does. Okay. Just think about how much money and time we spend on the luxury of these things. Name brand clothing, eating out, eating out at the finest restaurants. Um, What about extravagant celebrations? Birthday parties and anniversary parties and parties for the sake of having a party. Let me give you an example. Um, We had a homeless man live in our house in Elk Grove with us several years ago for about two months. We met him on a Saturday, and I think he moved in on a Sunday. We met him through a friend who lived near the Elk Grove Church that we were serving in. His name was Danny. He could fit what he owned in a few paper sacks. He wasn't happy about his situation but he was in need and he accepted our help. As we progressed through these couple of months, we had a conversation one day concerning how much the average American has, how much the average American possesses. He felt that so many of us have so much more than we need that many of us have no idea what it means to simplify or to live on little. I chided in that I felt that we, our family, lived pretty simply and without a lot of frills. He smiled, and he shook his head, and he said, we have far more than we need, and certainly far more than we think we have. It took me a while. I was a little bit offended by that, because I thought, well, we don't live extravagantly. To him, we did. So one day, after that conversation, the Lord began working on me. The Lord revealed some things to me. 
I opened up my closet one day to choose a pair of shoes after, shortly after that conversation, and it was like a light bulb went off. I have many pairs of shoes to choose from. Danny had one. I looked at my clothes, which I constantly tell my husband, I have nothing to wear. And it began to hit me again of the abundance of things that I have at my disposal. Danny was right. I have way more than I need. Perspective is everything, isn't it? Perspective, where he was coming from, was not where I was coming from. But he made me realize something. I was petty. I was selfish. I was petty. And I was thinking about myself and what I don't have. And here he had everything in two paper sacks. So, let's keep reading. That was free. Um, as we read on, Jesus gives us an example. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The answer to that question is no, you can't. Jesus gives us this example of birds. They don't fill their cupboards with food they won't eat. They depend upon what the Father feeds them. A few weeks ago during this summer, we had some different doors put on in our uh, closets and things. And I cleaned out my pantry. Do you know I had food from 2013 up there? Did you know that I had bugs in the food from 2013? Do you have bugs in your food? I have food up there that I never used. I bought, intended to use, did not use. We have things in our homes that we've paid good money for that we don't use. Think about that for a minute. And think about that, especially the next time you go to the store. Think about that. Are you seeing what this scripture is saying? It goes on to say, aren't you much more important than these birds? We are valuable. We are made in his image. We are very valuable to him. We're designed uniquely by God, the creator. The God who designed where to place the stars and the moon and the sky designed you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows what you're thinking right this very moment. So clean up your thoughts. You know what I'm saying? He knows you because he designed you. He created you. And we are valuable to him. It goes on to say in Psalm 139, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. I know that. You know that. Dwell on that. Meditate on that. You are wonderfully and beautifully made. You are precious to him. You are valuable to him. You see, each of us is personally designed by God, and he takes care of his creations. He promises to meet our needs. Food, drink, clothing. Yes, these are needs. But sometimes, sometimes he uses us. He uses you. He uses me to meet those needs in other people. This is the Holy Spirit at work. Have you ever been stopped in your tracks to give something to a stranger you've never met before, but you know he has a need, she has a need? Have you ever stopped to do that? You need to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit because God is using his people to meet needs in others, to show them love. So follow through with that urging of the Holy Spirit. Not only will they be blessed, you will be blessed, and we'll all be more dependent upon God for it. We are wonderfully made. We are valuable to God. We are so valuable to God that the Bible says this. God takes it to the next step. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He adopted us, handpicked us 
adopted us by choice. We are so valuable to him. When we invite Jesus Christ to come into our hearts, we become his family, his child. Everything that belongs to God now belongs to us. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Now, I want to take you um, on another personal story because this is a true story. When John and I were first married, we both decided that we'd like to start a family. We were older. We were in our late um, 20s, and we wanted to start a family. However, due to some surgery I had when I was 11 years old with a ruptured appendix and several surgeries, um, I was told that I would probably never be able to get pregnant. So, after we got married, we decided that maybe we were meant to help somebody else's kids whose family is falling apart, and they need some help from somebody else. So we went through the process to become foster parents in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Our first child was a 12-year-old boy who was physically and sexually abused by his biological father. When he came into our home, he, he didn't have a haircut. We got him a haircut. He was wearing old clothes with holes in them. We got him clothes. We got him shoes. He had not been to a dentist in years. We went to the dentist. We got him enrolled in the elementary school. We went and met his teacher. He only lived with us for a few short months before the judge awarded him custody back to his biological mother. The father went to jail. And, um, but we cared tenderly for him. They changed his name. His name was Chuck. We don't know where he is. We don't know where his life is. But we know that we made a difference for a short period of time. But we tenderly took care of him because he was in our charge. Do you understand that? Well, when you become a child of God, you are in his charge. And he tenderly takes care of all of your needs. If we, as foster parents, cared so much, for Chuck, how much more does our Heavenly Father want to take care of our needs? I know, I know that many of you came in here with needs today. Some are physical needs, they're tangible needs, others are relational, or you don't know what to do next. Maybe it's in your job, maybe it's in your business, maybe it's making a decision for something, but you're in need today. So I'm speaking to you today. How much more does our Heavenly Father want to care for our needs? He does, and he does so abundantly. So let's keep reading in Matthew from a, for another example from Jesus. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Here again, he gives us an example. When he compares our needs to the needs of the flowers growing in the fields, you see, our beauty now, because we have Jesus Christ in us, our beauty comes from within, because that's where he resides. He also saying here that if we do worry about such petty things, he's saying that we have a lack of faith. Do you want to be known for having a lack of faith in Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross for you, the one who took the nails for you? I want my faith to grow. I don't want it to diminish. So we need to feast on the word and let it grow. Jesus continues, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Do you want to be associated with the pagans? Not me. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows. You see, God already knows what we need. He knows what you need. 
and he will provide if we hold steadfast to our faith that he will come through. We can't let go of that. We need to build our faith. You build your faith by reading the word, reasoning scriptures with each other. John and I left the house this morning uh, without reading the word to each other. And before he locked the door, I said, run back in and get your devotional. And we read it on the way up. Be serious about this, guys. You need to feed your spirit. Because if you don't feed your spirit, you're dying of starvation. And you are ineffective for God. We need to feed ourselves on the Word of God. Now, this is what I want you to really hear. Here comes the verse that we need to pay particular attention to. It also calls for some action on our part. So it's verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, in grammar, the word but, B-U-T, it's a conjunction. It's a part of speech that connects this to this. Here it's telling us that in order for God to provide all that is needed in our life, we first need to seek his kingdom and his business, the business of God. God searches and seeks the lost. God wants us to help grow disciples. That's what God is about. We need to do that, and we need to seek his righteousness. What does that mean? It means that we are right with God. We just had the Lord's Supper a little bit ago, and that verse in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians said, examine your own heart before you take communion. Before you acknowledge him, make sure that your heart is right with him, your life is right with him, your choices are right with him, your relationships are right with him. Make sure you do that. He's given you an opportunity here. You need to be proactive here. God will meet all of our necessities when we first seek his kingdom and his righteousness. We must do something. We, this is an act of worship. It's an act of trust. It is an act of obedience. Seek his kingdom first. Seek his righteousness first. And all these other things, these things that you need, will come. So if we're to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first, we need to establish these as a priority in our lives. We might need to readjust a few things in our lives if we are to genuinely seek his kingdom and his righteousness with our whole heart. Nothing hidden back, nothing held back. Because that's the God we're, we're seeking, right? We can't hide anything. So what do we know about setting priorities? What do we even know about this word priority? Now here's, here's a few things that are taken from a recent survey about setting priorities. Priorities are important because they show how much you value whatever you're doing, whatever you're investing your time in. Whatever you set a priority on is what you value. It's also true about your money. Whatever you spend money on is what you value and what's important to you. Here we're talking about priorities. Setting priorities make decision-making efficient. Now, I want to tell you a story. I am a caregiver to a gentleman. He's in his 50s. He, is, um, he has some mental disabilities, and he needs somebody to just walk through life with. I happen to be that person. He, um, I'm his payee, and so I control his money. We go to the store, and he gets his food on food stamps, and he gets his disability check, and I pay his rent and everything. Well, I go to his doctor appointments, and he recently uh, was put on, he's a smoker. He rolls his cigarettes, okay, like they did way back then. And um, he was recently prescribed and approved to take a medication called Chantix. It is a pill that you take twice a day, and it is to curb your desire for smoking cigarettes, for tobacco. And when he first started taking these pills, he's, he was used to rolling like 20 cigarettes a day and smoking. And um, he, he said, oh man, the cigarettes taste terrible now. I'm maybe smoking three. 
okay? Then we get into week two, and I said, how are you doing? How are you doing on the smoking, you know? Because I have to, I know you're not, you're going to frown on this, but I go buy his tobacco, and I buy his papers, because I have the power to do that. But anyway, um, so I've been trying to help him buy less tobacco, buy less papers to help him. The second week came along, he said, oh, this is hard. This is really hard. And so I said, just maybe if you would just roll a certain amount in the morning and then ration them out for the day, that would help you wean yourself away from them. And then we get to week three, which was last week. And he says, I need more tobacco. And I said, dude, I said, come on. You've got to do something here to help yourself. You're getting medication to help you. You've already said it makes tobacco taste terrible. You've got to work with that. And you've got to make a decision that you're going to do this less and less and less. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, when you set a priority, when you make a decision, when it's important to you, you're going to follow through with that. And it's going to help make decision making easier and more efficient. You get that? A few of you did. Okay. So the next one is setting and following priorities help people manage their time better because now you have a plan. You have a plan. That helps. Without priorities, life would be chaotic. No stability, no goals, no plan, and no sense of accomplishment. You have nothing to work towards. So if you don't have a sense of priorities in your life, you're not going to value time. You're not going to value effort. You're not going to value results. You'll be like a leaf on a windy day, like today, leaves blowing everywhere. You're going to go here, there, and with no pattern, no goal. Okay? We need to be willing to make some changes in our lives to put God first and his righteousness, and then he will meet all of your needs. Now, I want to tell you another personal story. I'm, the Lord's brought us through some stuff, and I'm going to share some stuff. John and I were living in Minneapolis. Our kids were young. Our youngest had not yet been born, so this was about 25 years ago. My husband was working for a Christian radio station. I was working part-time with him. Everything was going well, we thought. We were working for a Christian radio station, okay? You think things are going to be done ethically and morally? I was, I was a stay-at-home most of the time, but I worked part-time with him. So we were deeply rooted in our home church, in leadership roles. We were serving the Lord. Then something began to happen. My husband's paychecks began to bounce. We would deposit the checks thinking they were good. We would pay our monthly bills thinking they were good. And we began getting NSF, mail from the bank. NSF. You know what that stands for? Okay, non-sufficient funds. More than I know what that stands for. Checks were being returned because my husband's paychecks were being returned for non-sufficient funds. We went into a tailspin. We were angry. We cried. We called the owner of the station who said he was sorry, made good on the check, and life went on okay until the next paycheck, and it happened several more times. We didn't tell anybody about this. We just scraped along. And you know that pressure that builds on you after a while, especially money, for me, I like security, and when, when we've been in financial strain in our life, I just felt like there was just weights on me, and I could hardly breathe sometimes. Anyway, um, then something happened. Um, then one day, we came home. We didn't share this with anybody. We came home. And there were seven bags of groceries on our front doorstep. To this day, we still don't know who did that. Okay? God did. God prompted somebody to meet that need. We still don't know who that was. 
And shortly after that, someone paid our rent for the whole month. Back then, I think it was $750. $750 was a huge amount of money. And somebody paid our rent for us. And you know what that did to John and me? We went to church that Sunday night, and during the music and the song singing, we sat there and we wept. We wept at the goodness and the extravagance and the kindness of our Father God. He knew our need. He met our need miraculously. And it built our faith for our little family that would be treated with such kindness by God our Father. And all we were was a family that wanted to worship God. But it begins there. It began with that choice. Yes, it was very difficult. For several months there, it was very difficult. We didn't know how we were going to get through each month. But I want to tell you today, we did by the help of God. All that said, this phrase is wrong. God helps those that help themselves. That phrase puts everything on you doing the work making it happen, maybe even creating the right plan, and maybe God will get on board and he'll bless it. Right? We've all done that before. No. God meets our needs because he cares. He cares about what you're going through. With this phrase, um, there's no selfishness involved. You don't have to do the work because God provides because he cares. That's his nature. Now, that does not mean that you get to sit on your bum and just let God rain down grocery bags from heaven. That's not what that means. He wants you to seek him. He wants you to serve him. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to be radically sold out to him so that he can meet these needs in your life. So he gets the glory and you get the benefit. Do you understand that? So no matter what you're going through today, it might not be food. It might be a decision about something. Seek God first and his righteousness. He will meet your needs in every possible way. If we're really concerned and focused on seeking God first, and on his righteousness, here's a few more verses that I want you to take home and I want you to meditate on these this week. This one from 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive. He will cleanse. He will purify us. It's on him. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. First him, then watch what he's going to do here. He will give you all that you need, period. He will give you work, he will give you a right attitude to change the way you're doing things that are not working in your life right now so that your plan will line up to his plan. Readjust your thinking. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He will meet all your needs. He will do it. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Amen. There is nothing in my life I don't have that I don't need. Because he's my shepherd. He cares for me. He's watching out for me. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty for God and his kingdom? This can be your prayer. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Today. Right here, right now, at these altars. We're not going to have any music playing, but the lights can come down. If anybody wants to seek God, 
and his kingdom and his righteousness and you have needs in your life, come right now. Come right now. Give that to him. Give it to Jesus. Seek his will. Seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. If you want him 100%, then you got to give yourself as 100%. Give it to him. Come this morning, and we'll close in prayer together. Father God, we want more of you. We want to feast upon the word of God. And sometimes, Father God, it's hard. It's hard for us to desire that because the things of this world just seem so, they draw us away. They're so distracting. And there's times in my life when I just feel dry inside, but today is a new day. I'm meeting with you today, Father. Give me a hunger. Give me a thirst for your word as the deer pants for the streams of water. So our soul desires your word, desires your truth. We desire you, Father God. We meet with you today because we're giving you 100% of ourselves. Because you have given 100% of you on the cross with Jesus. You give us 100% of you because you fill us with the Holy Spirit. So, Father God, we know that the things of this world, the food, the clothing, the drink, the things that we need on this earth will come when we seek you first. Father God, we lay it down to you today, and we just ask that you throw that seed deep down in us and help it to grow. Father God, so that we can worship you and you can work in us. In Jesus' name we thank you. And everybody said, Amen. At this time, it's a beautiful opportunity to give him just 100% of who you are by tithing. Tithing. He's asking for 10% of what he, he's gifted you with. And he's asking you, let go. Trust me. Give me that 10% and watch what I'm going to do at First Church by reaching the lost, growing disciples. Watch what I'm going to do. Ushers, come forward. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the hunger and thirsting that people prayed for, Father, at these altars a few minutes ago. We pray that you instill in each one of us a deep desire to hunger and thirst after righteousness and your truth and your word. Right now, Father, we give back to you a portion of what you've already blessed us with. Lord, be glorified in it and use it for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.